We're immediately going to get into spoiler discussion. If you clicked on this video and aren't ready to know how the game ends, then please leave now. Also, one other thing I want to note before I get started, I've never played the original game, so this is coming from the perspective of someone who is almost entirely new to Final Fantasy VII as a whole. The big problem I have with the ending of Final Fantasy VII Remake is that it establishes itself as a sequel to the original games and not its own standalone experience, which is what it was heavily advertised and touted as. The devs had to take this approach for several reasons. The first one is that old fans of the original might not be comfortable with an expansion on the original title. This is, in my opinion, pretty minor, as old fans will find anything to complain about. The second one is that whenever you serialize a game, you either have the problem that people don't play the earlier games in the series because they just weren't interested then, or refuse to play the latter games at all because they never played the first installments or just lost interest over time. This one is surprisingly not moot here because the game was advertised as a standalone and not as a sequel. I myself would have probably never purchased Final Fantasy VII Remake if it was Final Fantasy VII II on the box. However, the biggest reason is a huge guess on my part, and what I'm calling from here on the open world problem. This was my big question. How do you transition to modern game design after Midgar? If you want to keep the game a seamless experience, you had to take out random encounters. If you wanted to make the game have a better sense of its overall environment, you needed to have the world map be a perfect one-to-one -one scale compared to the characters. So how were they going to model out, remake, and scale up an entire planet's worth of detail that in the earlier days you would have been completely forgiven for cutting quarters on because of technical limitations? Final Fantasy VII Remake is 20 to 35 hours of content in what was originally only about a 5 to 8 hour experience. It's the beginning setup of a game that was much, much longer. In order to remake the original game's size and scope in a modern technical environment, you'd have to make the biggest handcraft in open world ever made. A game world that would either be lacking in detail and interesting things to do, which was Final Fantasy XV's problem, or would be so absolutely dense with filler that it detracts from the original game's theme and becomes more than a couple hundred hours of messy, thrown together gameplay content. So the answer, the obvious one, is circumvented entirely. Don't do it. Don't remake this part of the game at all. Since Square said this would be an experience that contained the entirety of Final Fantasy VII by the time it was done, here's where the problems truly start and why I believe they took this approach. Throughout the game, there are these ghost things that they end up calling whispers. These things appear, or rather according to the game, should appear when fate is about to be changed. Here's the thing. These fate ghosts are a completely pointless plot device, since the game could have been a standalone experience without trying to force an in-universe way to legitimize changes 40 hours into changes that already exist. If you made a short movie about these before the game came out, maybe I would have forgiven this. This takes you out of the experience entirely in such a jarring way. It's on the same level as if the developers of Final Fantasy VII Remake got in a room together, shot a full motion video saying, hey guys, this isn't the original game. Game, it's a remake, so there's gonna be changes. Thank you for your understanding of patience, and then they bow. But then they put it at the end of the game after you already played the whole thing. I don't know why this is even in here. It breaks the fourth wall, completely ruins immersion, and stands as a monumental why moment. Why remake Final Fantasy VII at all if you're gonna make a sequel to the original instead? This is considering that they could not have called this Final Fantasy VII II instead, because the game is, by and large, a reestablishment of events that already did happen. So therein lies the problem. This method gives them free reign to write whatever they want, but they're the original developers. They had that power already. I don't know why they thought that writing an excuse for them to change things would soften the backlash for them changing things, especially doing it afterwards. So let's break this down even further. The fate ghosts don't show up every single time there's a scene that is entirely new, and they don't show up every time something changes from the original. This contradicts this story moment and has its weight delegitimized before it even comes to you. For example, there's a scene in which Jessie has you go visit her parents, what is an extremely endearing character moment for the Avalanche team. They go to a Shinra warehouse to get bomb parts afterwards. During this entirely new scene, 
these ghosts never show up. I'm willing to say, okay, technically it happened in the original canon, so it's not changing fate, so to speak. But doubling up on your theme of changes would have been the correct move here. As a second example would be during Wedge falling or saving Wedge from the underground. The fate ghosts never directly interact with him, even though he originally dies. This is a pretty huge change of fate, but they're just missing. They're not here. The most jarring plot hole is that when trying to stop the main characters from disturbing fate, fate is trying to kill the main characters. This would arguably have a much larger impact on the fate of the world than killing Sephiroth, which doesn't matter either, since when the fight ends, the party only defeats the memory of Sephiroth from another timeline. I can't believe I'm saying this, and not the actual this timeline Sephiroth. This new Sephiroth from the remake and not the old games, then teleports Cloud to the end of all creation to ask him for his help, and show him that one day, all things will come to an end. Whether this is actually a legitimate offer on Sephiroth or Genova or whatever, whoever's part, is completely ambiguous, obviously, but the implications spell that the big bad's motivations have changed. As far as why his motivations have changed, or what he now plans to do, well, we're clueless. There is no explanation for how he knows anything that he does, or that Aerith seemingly also vaguely knows. To be honest, you don't need to explain how Sephiroth knows about the Fate Ghosts, but you do have to explain why his motivation has changed from cleansing the planet to try to keep the entire universe from dying out. This almost sounds like he's trying to make all of time into a singularity, which is Ultimecia's motivation from Final Fantasy VIII. In the end, I don't believe that the entire reason Sephiroth is trying to change Fate is so that he doesn't lose. I don't exactly know his character that much, as I've never played the original, but he really doesn't sound like the kind of guy who even cares about winning. Technically, less people have died as a result of his actions from what was originally fated. You could make the argument that if he knows what happened, he's actually a good guy for bringing back people from the dead. In fact, they play the scene back to you where Aerith dies, and the implication is that they are changing that from ever happening. So Sephiroth is unkilling people that are dead. This includes Zack, and even though he's alive, they didn't need this excuse to bring him back. Cloud's trauma and his character arc comes from a timeline that still exists. Cloud's relationship with Zack and every flashback doesn't change anything about what happened with him in this game. I could reasonably see Zack saying they had to part ways for now. Cloud repressing the whole thing emotionally and going to see Tifa for mercenary work anyway. Granted, my entire knowledge of Zack as a character is second hand, I've never played Crisis Core either, so maybe I'm talking out my ass about the consequences. However, if they had instead revealed that Zack had been alive the entire time, it would have had a much bigger impact and been a much bigger twist for fans. The fact that they used the exact same plot device in Kingdom Hearts 3's ending, which was the entire reason that game's ending was annoying, to establish the same exact thing here cheapens the experience. For people like me playing Final Fantasy 7 at all for the first time, it's just confusing as hell. I had to play the whole thing twice. I don't know what's going on, what it means, or what the implications are, and I know that's supposed to be intriguing and get me hyped for a sequel, but all it really did was devalue my entire gameplay experience. Even at the end, when you beat Sephiroth, the characters have to point blank ask and explain to each other, and the player, that we did not just in fact beat him even though we just thought that we did. We have to go find him and settle the score, which is the exact same place the original ended after Midgar. I don't understand why they needed to do this. As a writer, this ending bugs me. It should have just been the highway escape scene, them saying they had to hunt down Sephiroth, and Cloud having a flashback to Zack being alive at the end. You didn't need to include these fate ghost things, and you did not need to justify changing things from the original whatsoever if you were going to do it anyway. This writing baffles me because the rest of everything original to this specific remake is a masterclass on good character writing and detail. It fleshes out pre-established characters in ways that made this game something hugely special to me. I'm a fan now, something I could not say before.